platform. We welcome those who are joining us virtually and those who are in person. We would like to welcome Dr. David Forrester, who currently serves as the Vice President of Administrative Services and Chief Financial Officer at Halifax Community College in Weldon, Weldon North Carolina. Dr. Forrester, we are glad to have you here today. Thank you so much. The layout of today's forum will begin with Dr. Forrester telling us a little bit about himself and why he feels that he would be a good candidate for Dyer's First State. After his remarks, I will ask a few prepared questions that have been sent in by community members, students, faculty, and staff. Once those questions are complete, those who are in person, you may come up to the microphone at the appropriate time and ask your question. So with that being said, we shall get started. Uh, Dr. Forrester, if you will begin, and just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you would be a good fit for Dyer's First State. Be glad to. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here at Dyersburg State Community College this morning here in Covington. And uh, as was mentioned initially in, in my background, I currently serve as Vice President of Administrative Services in Halifax County, North Carolina, and Halifax County Community College. Uh, there, I, uh, I, I manage a, a team including the IT, security, finances area. Uh, campus maintenance and auxiliary areas on campus, such as a, a cafe. Um, we also have a, a daycare. We also have a healthcare clinic on campus. So I manage all those and have been involved in the management of them. Uh, the nasty thing we know is COVID on campus also, the COVID response team. Uh, so that's my current role. Previously, I had worked at uh, Roanoke Chowan Community College in a similar role. And before that, I had worked in the western part of North Carolina, close to Asheville, at Haywood Community College. And over there, I had been the uh, chair of the uh, business and entrepreneurship department on the academic side of the house. I had done that and also been an instructor at community colleges. So I have kind of the, the joint background of uh, instructional side, also the, the non-instructional staff side on the administrative side of things. I also have a, a license of as a CPA, a certified public accountant, and was initially licensed here in the state of Tennessee. Uh, I have uh, lived in Tennessee briefly in the eastern part of the state uh, for a couple of years over in Oak Ridge, Tennessee area. My uh, family is initially both my mother and father's side of the family, both from East Tennessee and the Knoxville area, uh, Knoxville, Knox County, and also from my mother's from uh, Granger County, uh, a little further up, uh, closer towards Kentucky. And so, uh, Certainly have an affinity for the great state of Tennessee. I've spent quite a bit of time here uh, in the state of Tennessee. Um, my father is a graduate of the University of Tennessee. So uh, I certainly um, I enjoy being in the state. My background also includes uh, a degree. Uh, I got an EDD degree for a doctorate degree for organizational leadership. And my organizational leadership degree is from Gardner Webb University. And have a master's degree in accountancy also from the University of South Carolina. And um, so I think from my background, from my years of experience that I have, um, my love of the vision, vision and mission statements that go along with community colleges to serve uh, the students and to make a difference in students' lives and also in the community's lives by making a difference in the students. That's really my passion, my desire. I've worked in community college for over 20 years now, and um, that's really all I know. That's what I feel I do best. Uh, and so that's, that's my passion, and that's why I'm here today in this presidential search, and I appreciate the opportunity. Okay. What are your core values, and how will you use them at Dyersburg State to build trust and integrity? Thanks for the question. I think that the core of everything is just ethics, trust, honesty, and respect. Um, valuing everybody at the organization, uh, from the top of the organization chart to the bottom of the organization chart, Everybody to me is treated the same. Everybody is certainly worthy of the same level of respect and same level of trust. Uh, so to me, a lot of importance is trust and relationships and also communications that people can come to me and address me and, and feel like I'm gonna help, help solve their problem because that's really what I feel like I do in my role. Uh, I feel like people bring problems to me and I help solve those problems. And, and that, that's, that's what I try to do best, but when I do so, I try to do stuff from an open, honest, respectful manner, and I think that's at the core of my mission and vision, personally, uh, from an ethical statement. Enrollment has fluctuated over the years. How do you plan to um, getting enrollment up 
and maintain the current staffing for that department. Well, that's um that's always a difficult situation. It's a difficult situation, I think, since about the economic downturn in maybe about 2008 to 10. I think it impacted our overall country. And I have worked in North Carolina's three small community colleges, and all three small rural community colleges were impacted the same way. Uh, that enrollment went up at the time of the economic downturn, and once that student base went through in a couple of years, it's been difficult to maintain enrollment at the same level. Uh, I think we see national trends of students that have migrated their ways towards the cities and less, less activity in the rural area. So it certainly has been a challenge. But I'll say on the academic side, when I worked in that area, I started up uh, a number of different programs to help students uh, find well-qualified jobs. And those were based off of Department of Labor statistics uh, that there were jobs available. So I started degrees in accounting, uh, started a, an entrepreneurship degree in, in North Carolina, which was the first one of the entire system uh, to help the local economy and small business owners. I also started up a medical office administration program, which was highly successful, and we had about 200 students in that, and did really novel things with that uh, in terms of uh, uh, online business learning uh, at a certain capacity, but also uh, having very much a word-based learning pro process at the end of it that the students were placed in, in job sites where they could get employed after they finish up their, their, their uh, schooling at, the, at uh, the community college with their associate's degree. So novel thoughts, um, I think, are important with programs, trying to find a demand of what there is locally and think about growing jobs. I mean, it's one of those where the economy always changes and new jobs come about and sometimes old jobs kind of wane. And it's one of those things we have to think about what's the change that takes place and how we can best address them. So that's from the, from a growth perspective, I think, look at programs and use data to do so. Um, but also on the standpoint of making sure we're staying within resources and budget and allocating human capital employees. Well, that's my level of expertise also as a CPA and a CFO. And that's where I think I bring lots of experience in that. Um, where I work currently, the first year I started, we had the greatest decrease in FDE enrollment for the entire system um, of all the 58 community colleges. But the next year we went into that process, we did not lay off a single person full time. Um, so I was able to come up with creative ways to make sure everybody stayed employed and we continued to try to move down the road as best we could. Uh, so I think that's my level of expertise. Okay. How do you define your leadership style? And please provide an example. I'll be glad to. I, I think from um, I have a participatory leadership style, meaning that I want to hear what others have to say, and I don't act like I know it all, because I don't. And, and sometimes if I get that you know, the hunch or notion that I do, all I got to do is go to the house and talk to my wife and kids. <laughs> and they all tell me I don't. Uh, so I don't pretend that I do. And so I rely very much on others and their level of expertise. Uh, kind of like many ways I look at it, I'm kind of like over here at the top, 25,000 foot, up in the air, flying above an air, aircraft kind of thing. Uh, I don't get down in the, in the trenches. I don't micromanage. Um, there's too many areas that, that I'm involved with to do that. Um, but the reality is I, I rely on very qualified team members to do what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but going back to the participatory part, I, I rely on their expertise and give me feedback. And we look at common goals and common objectives to go about completing things. Now, in the role as a president, I realize that I'm responsible to the board. And in that way, at the end of the day, if the initiative is a failure, um, it's, it's mine. You know, I kind of related when I was a, a basketball coach, and you see uh, whether it's a uh, uh, you know, Roy Williams in North Carolina or uh, Rick Barnes at UT, if there's a loss, um, they claim the loss themselves. And if there's a win, they say the players win. Um, that's the kind of role I think it takes as a, as a president. And, and, and that's the difficult part in terms of being a participatory leader is that if it goes wrong, it's all back to me. So at the end of the day, it's, it's my decision to make which direction we go finally, but I want to get as much input into the process as possible in terms of the participatory leader. 
How do you specifically use your experience from previous positions here at Dyersburg State? I'm sorry, could you repeat that one? How, how do you specifically see yourself using your previous experiences uh, here at Dyersburg State? Thank you. Um, I think I, I, I've uh, got a different background than most people do um, from a uh, from leadership aspect of it that I work both in the academics area at community colleges for um, more than 15 years on the academic side with faculty and being an instructor and being a chair and I also say, I, before I even started that, I was a high school coach and coach basketball. Uh, so I very much am used to the instructional side of things. And that's what enticed me to be uh, uh, moving my career in the direction of PG colleges in the first place, was the whole idea of the, the thrill of being in class and, and making a difference. Um, but also, I do have this other side that I feel like I can use the skills that I have uh, acquired through a doctorate degree in educational leadership and also from the standpoint of um, my CPA license and my background in business um, that I feel like I can use that, that strongly also. So uh, I have that dual talent base, I guess you could say, that I've worked on both the staff side and also on the academic side. And I think that's so much important in overall college because that's that, that's not saying that's all in all, but there's a lot that rolls through uh, an office that is a CFO and handling budgets. Essentially see everything. Everything goes out the door as a dollar. And I'm able to see all of that and, and try to best manage that for the best return on investment for every dollar we have because there's finite resources. But on the other hand, I try to use all my skills as on the academic side for somebody who's been in the classroom and started programs and has helped grow colleges in that way and help students go out to the workplace and find better jobs. And so I think my talent base is on both those sides. What is your comfort level with delegating authority? Well, in, in my role, I, I have to delegate. There's not a chance I'm going to get it all done otherwise. Um, there's there's no way. Um, when uh, I have as many varied areas as I do, I'll just use an example of uh, I manage the information uh, technology area. I don't claim to be an expert in information technology. I certainly rely on the people in that area for uh, uh, as a webmaster, as a system administrator, as a network administrator to keep the college safe, secure, have a good website, not have handle virus threats and all those kind of things. But I don't claim that I'm an expert in all those things. So I have to delegate all that process to them. I, I certainly work with them to achieve higher goals and aspirations and help to achieve our strategic plan in that area. But using that as an example, uh, just in that area, we have to move forward and advance as technology changes. But there's no way that I'm the expert in all those areas. So I, 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 in that process, I'm, I'm definitely have to delegate. And I'll just use that example as so much across the college. And in the role of president, I, I'm, I'm not getting down to people's business. It's too jammed, too. There's too much to manage overall. Uh, I can't possibly micromanage. It has to be delegated on a college scale. Okay, this one's a little bit lengthy. <laughs> you may have to add a little bit on that. So that's where the, the administrative team, the administrative council is so important. Uh, vice presidents and deans and others that would be in the administrative council would be so important in terms of strategic planning and initiating changes. <clears throat> Recent, recently, the Chronicle of Higher Education Club published a briefing titled, When it comes to organization politics, it's better to play offensive than defensive. The briefing states that it's helpful to know how the unscrupulous operate, not because should not because you should adopt their strategies, but to recognize when their employees are being used against you. How will you identify and manage unscrupulous people in the environment? Well, that's that's a very difficult question. Um, <laughs> very much a character question. And it's very difficult to know what's in somebody's heart and what's their real character and what's their real motivation. Um, so uh, all I know is, as I mentioned earlier, treat people with trust, respect, dignity, and communicate. And try to get people working as a common team. And I think any president eventually figures out who's going to work for them and assist them to meet goals and who's going to work against them and, and not help them put goals. And when I think about setting goals and objectives, because that's what any president in the system is going to do, 
Um, I think about timelines and, and steps by steps, not going from point A to point B instantaneously, but going from point A to point B as little steps of micro steps as we get there. Um, but in that process, um, I think any president is going to determine who's with them and who's helping them achieve those goals. And it's one of those where I think the unscrupulous um, kind of, uh, I guess, tell themselves in the end, their actions and activities end up telling uh, anybody in leadership, what if they're really with them as a team or not? It's uh, when I was at Gardner Webb University and, and was studying in my EDD program. Uh, one of the uh, lead faculty members there always like to say, "Get the right people on the bus and get the right people in the right seats, and then you get to the right place." And I think that's, that that is the, the situation here. Whether somebody is unscrupulous or not, I think they're essentially going to kind of out themselves in the end. In a recent project at your current institution, what was your process for assigning work and making sure people were set up for success? Well, in terms of assigning work, we look at things from a strategic plan aspect of it. On an annual basis, we set strategic plans of major macro level goals in areas. And as we do so, we work to achieve those goals each year. And part of that goal process is also involves the budget and so one thing I've done in my current institution is help to change the schedule that, that takes place, that the discussion of strategic plan happens early in the fiscal year, and then after that, the budgeting takes place because many times you can't complete the strategic plan items if you don't have budget resorted allocations. Um, so we make sure all that flows and we make sure that uh, in my area that we, as I mentioned in the last question, take, take micro steps sometimes if it's a bigger initiative to make sure we get where we need to go from point A to B eventually, but taking small steps to get there. Uh, I, during the year, I get progress reports if they're year-long goals. Uh, so, you know, we might start off with the goals in the previous year in, in March, and then um, during the year, as we go through the quarter, um, get, get reports on the IE plans. But uh, I stay very highly active with everybody that directly reports to me as a director. I uh, meet with them every day. I drop by their office to say, hey, um, I'm certainly not hanging in my office and just would close the door and that kind of mentality. Uh, I think it's key that I'm, I'm there and essentially uh, on site and, and seen and, and visible. And I ask people just if nothing else, how are things going? And is there any problem in your area? Um, and that way it lets them give me some updates on just a daily basis. But in terms of going from larger macro goals, it's, we look at it from an incremental process during the year with, uh, with uh, larger goals certainly being reported on quarterly back to me. And that's the way we work out. And, and we do a great job of meeting our goals and objectives. What will be your approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion with students, faculty, and staff? And how will you measure the success of those efforts? Well, that's a very important question in, in the United States at this point in time, um, certainly with what we've had in our recent history and our recent news. Um, uh, myself, I, I come from a diverse background, I'm part Cherokee, part Lumbee Indian from a tribe in Eastern North Carolina. Um, so I've, I've identified that way, and it's one of those things that I'm proud of in that way. I also will say that uh, from the standpoint of um, reaching out to different types of uh, population of students that we have. Uh, I also speak Spanish and have uh, gone out and done recruiting efforts myself on behalf of colleges when otherwise we didn't have uh, somebody to do so. So I've ended up uh, in locations, churches and other, other locations to try to recruit Hispanics uh, as a population, uh, which is certainly a growing student base here in the United States. It's the largest growing student base as a population. Um, and my current workplace, we have uh, a Native American celebration I've helped uh, organize uh, that celebration and serve as AMC for the event a couple of years ago. And um, we also, at my, at my campus, we have uh, a large amount of activity in, in the month of February for Black History Month. We have a number of speakers and a number of events that take place. And I've been actively involved with those and helped to organize and plan those and make sure that those are properly funded and bring who we need to talk as guest speakers and, and make sure that uh, we're, we're certainly uh, celebrating uh, Black History Month appropriately. So it's one of those we, we certainly look at um, a lot of different uh, ethnic situations and races at our campus and try to address those and make sure everybody's understood that everybody's respected 
and, and, and opportunities take place where students on campus are invited to attend all the events that we have. Uh, we do that from, uh, we have a, a certain pot of money to set, set aside for cultural events each year. And I'm all, also actively involved in uh, working with the budget with that each year to make sure we do get those events on campus like we want to. Um, but also, I, I do also manage the HR area, human resources. And in human resources, we also try to make sure that we have a diverse population in terms of who we're hiring and also in the leadership roles. And uh, the last two uh, community colleges, including the current one that I work at, uh, more than half of the, the population is of minority. Uh, we have grants on campus, for example, right now, where I'm at, we have a predominantly black institution grant that's from the Department of Education. And we have um, initiatives that take place to help. Uh, in that case, the grant specifically for black males and to improve their their educational performance and overall um, black males graduation rates. Um, so it's something that we certainly celebrate and I help uh, in, in the process of the financial side of things with that and making sure goals and objectives get met that way also. So from an institutional perspective, we look at it and try to do things, not just from our grants, but also from our celebrations on campus that I've also actively been involved with um, and certainly embrace my, my own heritage also. So. Um, diversity, inclusion, and equity are very essential to me. How do you plan to make connections throughout the communities that Dyersburg State serves? Well, I think for that, it, there's, it's, first it's a challenge because there's seven counties and there's lots of folks that are going to want to talk to a president about lots of topics. Um, so that just means it takes time, but my door is open and the uh, the car will be going down the road to go talk to folks if needed um, in any area in any county uh, the reality is that um, in the county service area is seven counties it's a large geographical expanse there's lots of folks there's that, that to talk to there are businesses to talk to about ways that we can partner with businesses there are contributors that are potential for foundation uh, to help improve the, the student um, process here at the college and, and improve the, the scholarships and also improve facilities and equipment that we could have here at the college. Um, there are those that are just uh, community leaders in various areas that also need to be talked to. And just essentially, you know, my door would be open and the car would be going down the road to talk to whoever. Um, but it is a large geographic base, so this certainly would not happen very quickly um, because there's lots of folks. Um, but, uh, I'm used to interfacing with lots of um, lots of areas. I currently um, work with uh, economic development at uh, an area close to me on Lake Gaston, where I'm the college representative. I'm also involved with the Chamber of Commerce. I'm also involved, I'm the vice president of the local Rotary in, in, in my county. Um, and, and certainly from my business background, I don't have any, any problem at all uh, going out and, and asking for money. Uh, because I think there's plenty of folks that as contributors, they they feel in many cases, I think from a, from a small rural area, uh, from colleges, that small rural colleges are the biggest changer, biggest driver, or bigger difference maker there is in the areas. Um, and so with that, I think there's a lot of folks that really feel like the community college is dire for our state. Uh, for example, is going to be the biggest driver, biggest contributor of what happens in the local economy and what happens to students in the long run and want folks to stay here in the local area and not go other places and cities and feel like there's going to be money and that they can contribute as donations to help those things occur. So um, the answer would be I would have the, uh, uh, the, the car would go down the road or the meetings would occur on the office on campus, but I certainly would be able to talk to lots of folks. What is your knowledge and experience with grants? Um, I would say I have a fairly extensive knowledge with grants. Uh, currently, we've, we've managed five different uh, major grants, um, most of them from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and, and with those, my process of that is that um, I kind of leave the central grants process from the administrative side of things. I've helped uh, lead the process to write a grants manual on campus. Uh, we have um, changed some of the functionality in the 
accounting office to have somebody that's more of a grant expert. And that's essentially about all they do is just grants and institutional type of funds um, because it's such a such a large emphasis at the, at the campus. Um, and, and so with it, I feel like I, I have a lot of expertise in the process of administrative and the grants process, including this week, I, I uh, signed up for uh, new grant proposals for more than a million and a half dollars that we're going out to try to acquire this this week. Um, and my process of that is is to receive the information from the from the resource development area and, and i look at all the overall operation how the plan would flow and also look at it from the, the financial aspect of uh, whether the uh, grant looks like it's going to meet the objectives and the finances within the financial budget and so i look at that from all that aspect of it and I sign off for it and the president of my current employer signs off on it so I think I have a lot of expertise in that area, and uh, we certainly have a lot of experience using with major grants, including uh, U.S. Department of Education. What do you see as Dyersburg State's biggest challenge and biggest threat, and how would you address them? Well, I, I'll say I, I can't say for certainty. Um, not being from here in West Tennessee. Um, and, and not knowing all the intimate details of Dyer to State Community College. I have looked at the data profiles there is at the Tennessee Board of Regents. Uh, I've done some studies. They've told, they've told a lot. Um, but it looked to me like there had been a little bit of a decline in enrollment. And that does not surprise me from the standpoint of what I mentioned earlier. So uh, rural areas have had across the country difficulty with enrollment and keeping up enrollment. So uh, I, I would think that might be one of the biggest challenges to to try to keep programs relevant and to try to keep um, uh, students coming out the door with job skills that are applicable in today's market and that, that are uh, that are hot that able enable the students to come out to get jobs. Um, those those might be one of the biggest challenges. And and I don't think I addressed the last part of your question. We had the and the biggest threat and how would you address them? Well, in terms of addressing that. I would look at um, what could be done in terms of a variety of types of, of programs or classes that could be taught. For example, there's there's dual credit with high school. Are there things that we could do to increase that? Are there areas that are not being served? Are there high schools where particularly the dual enrollment percentage of students that enroll is high and others that are not high? And my question would be kind of why? Um, so I would look at that. I would look at uh, different programs that we offer associates of applied science type of programs and look at those and see are, are, are we following what industry says to follow? Can we do things that make it more for students to have industry certifications and easier to get jobs? Uh, I would look at other programs like uh, general ed, uh, transfer type of programs to make sure that we're doing everything in place to make sure that our students are coming out with good skills and that they have my experience in the past is students sometimes uh, struggle with math on the front end. Are, are we addressing math enough on the front end to make students uh, um, highly qualified to go through the rest of the program and successfully complete it? Are there things that we can do for overall retention? Those are, those are things I would look at, uh, but I don't have those answers at the moment without having more intimate detail. Uh, but by addressing some of those concerns, it could cause us to grow the student base and have greater students not just enroll but retain students and, and help them progress to graduation. Okay. Following after a president with a 37-year tenure can be both rewarding and daunting. A campus culture is likely deeply embedded. How will you work to change culture where need, where need the embrace uh, where appropriate? And how will you discern the difference? First, I can hardly believe 37 years. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, the culture change, any way about it, whoever comes through this process, you've got five candidates, whoever comes through, um, there's going to be a culture change. That's just the reality. Um, that uh, the efforts of 37 years are great and glorious, uh, but sometimes things will have to come to pass, and the reality is, Whoever is chosen is going to be a culture change. Um, it just will. So um, some people will embrace that and some people won't embrace that. Um, but the reality is it, it will take place. Um, and, and in that regard, um, what I would do, 
again, I would start off by, I'm going to call it a listening tour, um, to listen to everybody and see where they're at and see what Dyersburg State Community College is doing well in somebody's own opinion and what things we might be able to do better because I'm a believer of continuous improvement. Um, some things we might be able to do better and, and start from that standpoint and then look to develop action plans around those if I see enough consensus here from the board that these are things from, a, uh, from an overall perspective and strategic plan that needs to be looked at, then I can certainly come up with an action plan and a vision as to how to go about making those things change. But I think the key out of this also, and, and I'm going to hark it back to my time at Gardner Webb University and, and um, organizational change classes, um, it's really important in that process to take many steps to get to where you need to get to, to get the right people on the bus and the right seats to move people in the right direction and move the off process to where it needs to go to, to communicate to everybody in the process what's going on and why, and to let people understand we're going from point A to point B, and here's why, here's how life's going to be better at Battery Brook State Community College. Um, but it won't be the same after 37 years, without a doubt. Um, that, that's for sure. So there will be change that will come about. Um, but I think I can certainly help in that process and try to make it uh, so that the transition and change happens, but from happens from the standpoint of employees understanding why we're doing what and why we're changing. Um, but the culture will change, um, but that's just real. Should faculty have more of a differentiated types of faculty roles? In particular, should faculty create new tracks and faculty members who can harness technology to teach hundreds or thousands of students, both on-site and remote? So the question is about Primarily about instruction. Their roles. Their roles. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm a believer that faculty members in today's world with this technology as, as at the forefront for students, and not saying all of our students are younger students, but a lot of our students are younger students, including students that we have as uh, dual credit students in high school. Um, they're very used to technology. Um, I was at the forefront when I was at it was community college in the western part of the state of a um, long time back moving towards distance learning and uh, thinking that there was the way of, of things to go and i've heard data uh, many years ago from the the director of distance learning at that institution that about 75 percent of classes in the future would either be distance learning classes or hybrid classes um, to meet the, the goals and aspirations of students and hybrid i mean that the class is partially taught on site and the class is partially taught online. And, and I believe therefore that we need to listen to our student base because they are our clients. Um, I'm gonna come back into my business side of things at the moment. Uh, our job at, at the community college is we provide services and the services we provide are to our students. And it's our job to listen to what the students want. And the reality is when I try to offer classes at night classes as a, in, in, on academic side when I did that and I couldn't get anybody to show up but I offered classes online and a bunch of people showed up then it's pretty easy for me to figure out which way we need to go um, because our job is to serve the student banks um, they are our clients and so we need to listen to them so in terms of skill sets and remote I do think it's important to do so and I have been involved in that since about the year 2000 um, when in the early phases of, of going to programs to moving more in, in an online capacity and that's not always easy because instructors uh, many times come in and there's great communicators and I've had some instructors who are great storytellers and they enjoy being in class and that's what they they, they say this is why I started and this is why I signed up to do what I'm doing on the other hand, if the students won't sign up for the class, physical, and they will only sign up for the distance learning class, then something still has to change because we have to meet the students' needs. Um, so I, I did also lead the process of professional development and allowing um, faculty over a measured period of time to gain their skills online so that they would be able to teach online in a better form and fashion. 
and, and we would do so in a manner that uh, still the, the faculty member would get to show some of the personality. Many times we use videos. We would, we would use videos at that point in time. Uh, currently, where I'm at now, we also have a, a streaming capacities where we can teach on site at one location and we can stream it live to somebody's house or to other centers um, as we have a couple other campus centers off, off the main site. So there, there, the technology use is there, but I think it's mainly because we need to listen to our, our student base because they are our clients and if we're not serving our students, we don't have jobs. Um, that's about the way that I look at it from a business perspective. And it's our, it's our job to figure out how to best go about doing so. In the past, I had done so with professional development and, and trying to keep updated with technology and interfacing a lot with the director of business life. What are your long-term goals for Dyersburg State and how will you employ your team members to achieve these goals? Well, I think those are, those are really difficult to ask in this chair at this moment. Um, the reality is I look at it from uh, there are data points that the Tennessee Board of Regents has uh, comparing Dyersburg State to other community colleges. And I haven't gotten into the deep detail of all those data points, but the reality is I would certainly like us to, to be toward the top of the list of achievement in all the points. Um, in North Carolina, we have, for example, we have seven benchmarks for performance on the academic side. And I'll mention just a couple of them, for example, it's um, do students complete a math class, uh, a college math class in two years in their program? Do students complete uh, an English class in two years in their program? Do students go out and, and obtain their uh, licensure for external agencies uh, after they finish out for their, or their graduation rate as well? Uh, that would be in areas like cosmetology and nursing and, and other areas where it has external accreditations. Those are the type of measurement points that I would look at in detail. And, and, and the Tennessee Board of Regents is tracking all that for a good reason. So I think it's one of those where I certainly would like us to move up towards the top of that list in terms of achievement would be, uh, I think those are overall macro goals. At the same time, I would like to see us uh, grow uh, number of students, uh, grow students that can come out and make a difference and graduate and work here in the local economy. Uh, I would also like to uh, say I would be involved in growing the dollars that come to the foundation. Uh, grow overall donations. And I would also like to say I uh, would be involved in growing um, the overall community and, and how it feels towards the college and helping uh, the community feels like they're part of the overall college. Not that just we're on a physical site, but this is the community of the college uh, for a seven county area. Those would be goals that would have. Where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, hopefully in the president role right here. <laughs> okay. What would be your overall SWOT analysis of Dyersburg State? And briefly describe how would you best capitalize on or address each component of the SWOT analysis? That, that's a little difficult to do from uh, from being an outsider uh, is the reality. I think I mentioned earlier uh, rural areas and sometimes the decline of enrollment that might be a, uh, something that could be looked at as a uh, some area that could be improved upon. I can't really, uh, as an outsider, very easily pick up and spot up uh, weaknesses. And, and uh, uh, for example, I don't think I'm going to try to do that in one in the area or even body in here. That's uh, I don't have any background to do anything of that nature. Um, I think it's just one of those over time, I would have to acquire uh, more information to do so. And it certainly can take place. And I think from my background, that's one of the areas that I, I, I work very well within, try to find uh, areas that we're really good at and areas that we might have some gaps in that we might be able to improve some and try to work on areas that we can improve some on a kind of measured basis. Uh, but there, I don't think, from um, my perspective of walking here today, I don't think I can really uh, put together a SWOT analysis. Have you ever asked for feedback on your management style, and what were the results? Uh, yes, uh, certainly. Um, uh, if I'm not doing what I do uh, well, my my employees will tell me. 
<laughs> they'll, they'll tell me uh, uh, things that I can do better, and uh, and and when they do, I try to try to do better. Um, you know, I don't make everybody happy all the time. I'm not a perfect person. Um, I think it's one of those things. I think the biggest thing that, that is uh, that I try to focus on is I try to focus on what I'm communicating and where I'm communicating it to and who I'm communicating with. And I think the one thing that sometimes takes place, sometimes in community colleges we get so busy that we might forget somebody off from our list of the who. That we think we've got most everybody covered in an email and it goes to 15 people and we needed a 16th person. And that 16th person, person feels like there's like um, but if that's that's the thing I try to work with more than anything else, making sure I communicate to everybody I need to communicate with. Okay. How much of the president's time should be spent articulating a vision or strategy versus directing the college's operations versus fundraising? Okay, so we got fundraising, we have operational strategy, and we have day-to-day -day management. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think it depends on the organization and it depends on the focus and the directives also from the board as to where that goes to. I think they're going to give general guidance. Um, I have worked at organizations that um, needed assistance in all three areas. Um, I worked at some places that were um, much smoother in all three and had more things lined up and had uh, people that had worked for a longer period of time, so there was more stability and there was less need for day to day management. Therefore, they went out and spent more time in the foundation raising funds. I've also worked places that were more turnover and more change, and they needed more day to day assistance to keep the, the ship rolling down the, the, the route like it should. And therefore, there wasn't as much focus on foundation and strategic plan happened on a, on a less frequent basis. So, I think it depends, and it depends on um, you know, the, the setup and the organization. The good thing here is that you have a president that's been here for 37 years, and that provides a lot of stability. And as long as it's lots of stability, therefore it should lead for more of strategic planning, more macro picture, let's set goals, and more raise money for foundation in other ways, so grant funding, which I'm very much big into. Uh, and less day-to-day -day operation needs because there should be more structure in place. Um, as a percentage, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea, but it would seem to me that would be the case. Okay, that will conclu conclude the prepared questions that we had. Is there anybody in the audience that has any questions? Welcome to Irishburg State, first of all. Thank you. Um, can you tell me what your thoughts are on tenure for the faculty? Uh, what do you believe in keeping that program here? Because Irishburg State does have tenure tracks. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I, I hadn't had that much thoughts on that. It's something in North Carolina that we don't do. Um, so it, I'm assuming it's primarily would have originally been set up to the Tennessee Board of Regents. And if it's the norm to continue and other colleges are doing it, then I would like to do the same. Um, I, I guess I would say whatever the program is to set up and whatever is the general, the general process, I would not like to deviate from that. Perfect. Will you consider the thoughts of the faculty that's already here that's been the stability of the college. Will you talk to them about what they want and, and what they think you should do and not just look at what the other community colleges are doing in Tennessee? Oh, sure. Um, and, and I would probably imagine that will take place in the uh, discussion with the faculty today. They might ask about that. So I certainly would. And as I mentioned um, in the earlier part of uh, today's, uh, today's forum yeah. session, uh, part of what I would plan to do would be come in and do what I'm going to call a listening tour and listen to everybody and hear what they have to say. And that certainly would include faculty. And that certainly would let, would let the whole faculty talk about that topic of tenure and their opinion of it of why it's important or why it's not. So, yes, ma'am, definitely. 
Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay. Okay. At this time, is there anything else you would like to add, or any additional final comments that you would have like to have, Dr. Forster? Well, I just appreciate the opportunity. Um, Y'all came out here at eight o'clock on a on a on a rainy day in Covington <laughs> for this. So I certainly appreciate you that you come out, and um, that makes me feel uh, uh, just gracious to be here in your presence today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, and appreciate being one of the final five candidates for your role as president. And I just uh, thank you for coming out here today. And if you have any questions after we finish up. Um, then I'll certainly be out around here and, and I will certainly help to address those also if you've not felt like bringing those to the microphone and you want to talk to me otherwise. But just glad to be here. I'm glad to be in Covington doing a great state of things. Thank it has been our pleasure to host Dr. Forrester on campus today. You're invited to complete a survey about the finalists for the next president of Dowersburg State. Access to the survey may be found on TBR's website under Executive Searches or via QR code that is posted near the exit as you leave today. Thank you for your participation and being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.